Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. After an 18-week long session, lawmakers adjourned sine die last week. But they're not done yet. They'll be back in session next week to deal with several big ticket items. What will become law and what will have to wait until next year? The 2019 legislative session concluded on May 9th with 102 bills making it to Governor Henry McMaster's desk. But some major bills, including a much-touted education overhaul bill, which McMaster pushed hard for since January, failed to make it this year. The education reform bill was passed by the House but stalled in the Senate, which held 15 meetings on it and removed some controversial elements. That's since left only the $9 billion budget as the main vehicle for any changes this year, including teacher pay raises, money for high-poverty school districts, and more. House Speaker Jay Lucas said despite the early momentum, he was always certain that education was going to be a two-year matter. And again, if you go through the budget, the Senate budget, you see all the great things in the Senate budget were taking out of the House reform bill. So what we've got to do is work with them in the off session um, so we can try to have a um, complete reform bill. But um, no, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm actually encouraged on the education front. Um, we can't consider education as a one-time thing. Um, we've got to continue to do education year in and year out. I've made the promise that in five years we're going to have teacher salaries at the national average, and that's where we intend to be. One major bill that squeaked past both chambers at the end changes state law to allow tax breaks for professional sports teams, specifically the Carolina Panthers NFL team. McMaster and legislative leaders led the charge on the bill, which would help the state entice the team to relocate its headquarters and practice facilities to Rock Hill. The bill was one of a few contentious issues that lawmakers dealt with in this first year of a two-year session, and small details are still being hashed out. As for other bills that haven't made it to McMaster's desk, well, they remain where they are until lawmakers return in January 2020. Joining us to break down the winners and losers of the 2019 session is Christina Myers with the Associated Press and Avery Wilkes with the State Newspaper. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, so we just wrapped up May 9th. That was the last day of the regular session. We still got some things to deal with. Uh, but Christiana, I kind of want to start with you. Uh, the big theme of this session was education. We had everyone on the show talking about that. We had lawmakers in the beginning of session talking about that. Um, but what happened there at the end? We saw it get stuck in the Senate, and that seems to be the ball game for that. Right, right. Uh, House Speaker Lucas, uh, Jay Lucas, introduced this education reform legislation early on, and he pretty much knew that this wasn't the absolute answer to fixing education here in South Carolina, but he knew this was a jumping off start. So the House actually passed the version in March, and it, when it got over to the Senate, they took on a different approach to tackling education. They went section by section trying to eliminate some of those areas that they had problems with. They also had 15 meetings, um, four public hearings in schools across the state, really trying to hear from the stakeholders, the teachers, the educators, uh, those education advocates. But like you said, it, it got stuck there in the Senate. Um, this is something lawmakers say is going to be a multi-year fix. They knew this was something they could not resolve this year. Now, Governor Henry McMaster has spoken out saying that he was pleased that members of the House were able to pass education reform, but kind of criticized the Senate saying they failed to mm -hmm. act on it this year. And of course, we heard from the teachers, 10,000 strong came to the State House grounds mm -hmm. for a um, school day rally saying, hey, that we really want to see something happening with education. I know some of those teachers do understand that this is, again, a multi-year fix. And so even though that reform wasn't passed this year, lawmakers mm -hmm. are trying to address those issues through the budget. And Avery, along those lines, I mean, there, there was action on the budget that we did see kind of going forward, like the only fix for education this year, too. But there was some initial heartburn, at least over in the House, in the way that that bill was crafted and rolled out, that the teachers really came out in force in the beginning. Uh, we saw since the Senate kind of mitigate that a little bit. But uh, do you think that was really maybe the kind of issue, kind of like foreshadowing, maybe causing all the issues going forward? Was that just the initial trust didn't seem to be there for teachers? Yeah, I think the teachers had the idea, uh, and, and Speaker Jay Lucas kind of rebuffed this a little bit, that the bill was drafted without their input, that uh, it was done kind of behind closed doors starting in November until January when it was introduced, this 84-page piece of legislation they don't feel they had enough input in. Um, the, the, the teacher rally was, was really interesting because there were 10,000 people there, but there wasn't really one strong unifying message other than that we're frustrated and, and you guys need to fix education. Um, some people in the rally probably were thinking, you know, you need to pass this bill or, or pass some version of it. Um, and then other people were thinking, no, absolutely not. You know, this, this bill is terrible. Um, there was a lot of um, 
just debate about whether the bill should even be passed. Obviously, like you said, Governor McMaster called the um, the House and the Senate to, to stay late this year and, and work and, and mm. fix education and, and, and finish it this year, knowing that it's going to be a multi-year process and that you're going to have to come back next year to do uh, the funding formula. You're going to have to come back in, in, in later years to deal with school discipline and, and, and classroom uh, management, that kind of thing. Uh, but there was just a lot of animosity toward toward the House, uh, especially and for for not including teachers. Um, and, and of course, like I said, Lucas and, and other House leaders said that they included them throughout the way and that they've actually been working toward this for four or five years mm-hmm. uh, since the Supreme Court ruled that South Carolina doesn't provide a minimally adequate um, education to, to some of its students. So, you know, that, that's really been the rub. Uh, and then, like you said, the Senate, the Senate doesn't work on anybody else's time but the Senate. They mm-hmm. work on Senate time. And uh, Education Chairman Greg Embry said several times, we're not just going to pass a bill for political expedience. We're not going to pass it because someone is telling us to. We're going to pass a good bill, uh, and we're going to pass it on our time. Mm-hmm. I and mean, what was the message, Christine? You're out there covering that 10,000-strong teacher and their advocate rally. Right. Um, what did lawmakers take away from that? Did I mean, obviously, there's no big, there was no big change because the bill was dead for the year. Right. Uh, but do you think it, it said, hey, you know, we can't take them for granted? I mean, we even saw bill, we even saw some changes in the, the budget later on recently right, right. Uh, because of that. So what, I mean, they, they did notice and apparently they are taking note. Right. And even uh, Russell Ott introduced a proposal into the budget that the House ended up passing. Of course, the budget hasn't been finalized yet. That kind of addressed classroom sizes. That is one of the main issues. And from what I heard from the teachers, they want to emphasize it's not so much about pay even though we know that teacher attracting teachers into the profession and maintaining, retaining them in the profession mainly stems around rate pay raises and making sure you're paying these teachers, show them that you value them here in the state. So for them, they wanted to make sure the message was heard that is more than the pay. It's about dealing with those issues that are going on in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Like on the Senate side of the budget, they introduced a proposal, about $2 million from the school resource, a school fund, mm-hmm. um, safety fund, that would go towards hiring these school counselors that can come in and deal with these other issues that are going on in the classroom that are taking um, teachers focus away from instruction. Mm-hmm. So I think it was just about, like you said, sending a message. And I mean, considering that the rally was started by uh, SC for Red, who is a teacher organization that started on Facebook, really mm-hmm. grassroots efforts that just brought in so many teachers, retired, those who are associated with education there. So I think it pretty much sent a clear message to lawmakers that will hopefully, and what the teachers are hoping that can feed the momentum going into January. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about respect for the profession, mm-hmm. I think, is, is, a, is a big encompassing part of it. They obviously they want better pay, but they really want the profession of teaching to be to be upheld and, and to be treated better than they think it is right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I talked to a lot of those teachers who do so many different things and they don't get the respect they deserve. And a lot of those things you really can't legislate, I know, but right. you know at the same time I think it was just them hearing those grievances. But kind of switching gears from education to another big issue that kind of cropped up later, Avery, was that Panthers incentive bill. Um, it was kind of a little little fun action there towards the end of the session, uh, trying to get you know the, the the law changed to fix tax incentives to attract you know major sports teams. Uh, kind of tell us what we ended up with at that point because we have talked about this a little bit, but you know what happened in the Senate specifically uh, and where we are right now going forward. Yeah, the House passed the bill quickly. They were on board with it basically from the beginning, and they passed it basically on an assurance from. House Majority Leader Gary Simmerl, uh, York Republican, whose district will obviously benefit from this, that it is a good deal for South Carolina and that the cost-benefit analysis uh, is good. That you know, Basically, the investment we're giving the Panthers and letting them keep their employees' taxes is going to give us a good economic impact uh, on, on the back end. And um, the Senate, <laughs> as it typically is, was more skeptical. Mm-hmm. Uh, senator Dick Carpoulian um, from, from Columbia here, freshman senator, mm-hmm. uh, put a block on it for two months and forced the Department of Commerce to release information that almost never has before or, or uh, typically doesn't. Uh, and then he hired his own economist to question those, uh, those figures and basically said that uh, the state is exaggerating the economic impact. Uh, and then it came down to a three-day Senate debate. It was uh, on the last week. It eventually passed on the last day. Mm-hmm. Um, and only after some provisions were tacked onto it that would add economic incentives for rural areas, for companies expanding or locating there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's some slight <laughs> differences between the Senate version of the bill and the House version of the bill. Ultimately, what the bill would do would, would bring the Panthers' headquarters and, um, and practice facilities to Rock Hill, uh, kind of a big 
uh, state-of-the-art type facility complex like you see in, for the Dallas Cowboys or, or other top NFL teams. Um, but they're not going to be playing their home games in, mm -hmm. in South Carolina. And there's it's even an attempt to put an amendment on there to require <laughs> them to play a couple yeah. home games, which would yeah. have create a lot more yes. issues. Than Senator Larry fix. Grooms proposed that and basically the entire internet came roses <laughs> one and said this is a this is a bad idea. We're never going to do this. Not even preseason. Um, so, but so that's that, one of those bills that they're still working out right now. Just some details between the, the yeah, Senate and the it's, House it's, version. It's one that's f that everyone expects it to pass. Mm -hmm. um, but but there are some some slight tweaks that the Senate made that the House wants to take a better look at and, and try to see if they can get those removed or, or altered. Christy, do you think we saw some House versus Senate angst going on there? We did talk to the Speaker about how the relationship is between the two bodies, and it kind of was a come to Jesus there in the last day with the Senate coming over into the House and Speaker Lucas saying, oh, no, we have a great relationship with them. We can right. go to them any time. Well, why did it happen on the last day then <laughs> that right. everyone had to come over and create this kind of situation, especially when the Senate was trying to get a bill passed that they wanted, dealing with the appointment powers for the governor that right. they kept tacking on. So it seems like... There was a lot of tension that last week, that last day specifically. Yeah, you definitely noticed it during that time because, like you're saying, even with the Panthers bill initially coming up, that was something that we saw both sides, senator, uh, the senators and the representatives coming both saying that this is something that would be good for our state. But definitely towards the end of the session, you really did see that angst and how some of the senators were saying, hey, there are certain things that we want to see pass in our in our." Um, this year, mm -hmm. and they really were pulling on, asking legend and lawmakers on the other side of the aisle to make sure they pulled through for them. So yeah, you definitely could see that tension kind of rising towards the end. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, they're trying to get things done this year, so. And how often does that happen? <laughs> yeah. I mean, every year, right. uh, the, the, the top three guys in the Senate or the top three guys in the House, mm -hmm. in, in the last hour, tip, usually on the last day, mm -hmm. probably not the last hour like it was this time, but they have to come in and They've, they've used their leverage as long as they can, but eventually you have to get to a point where, hey, we've got to pass a signing die resolution mm -hmm. and we've got to pass some other things that are, that are top priorities. But anyway, one of the big issues there was about the governor's appointment of power and his ability to do that uh, off session without the confirmation of the Senate. So is that resolved at this point or is that something that they're still working through? I think there's an opportunity to resolve it. It's not resolved long term. Uh, basically, that, that cropped up when the governor uh, unilaterally appointed uh, Charlie Condon, a uh, former SC Attorney General Charlie Condon, as Santi Cooper's next board chairman last year, uh, last summer, after the Senate failed to take a vote on that appointment earlier in the year. Uh, the Senate took that, you know, there's a lot of pearl clutching, and, and the Senate did not like that because uh, the Senate uh, really respects its advice and consent um, responsibility. It, it thinks that's one of the more important roles of the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the governor circumvented that in their minds, they took him to court, the governor won. Um, and, and then there was the other episode where the governor um, appointed a longtime friend, Stephen Morris, to, um, to become the director uh, as of the Department of, on Aging. Mm -hmm. And the Senate rejected him 42, overwhelmingly said he wasn't qualified for the job. And the governor then wrote him a one sentence, one paragraph letter saying, you're going to stay until the job until um, until I nominate someone else and they are approved and mm -hmm. confirmed by the Senate. So the Senate retaliates. Um, it files at least 20 amendments yeah. uh, to 20 different bills with this, this language that would curb the governor's appointment power, reinstate advice and consent as mandatory for uh, for those appointments, and they just attacked it on every bill that they passed and sent back to the House. And then the next day they reversed <laughs> all everything and yeah. would slow down the process, really especially when you, the process. every hour. Yeah, and that's, yeah. It's, it's all leverage. It's all mm -hmm. about leverage. Right. Uh, the House was not happy about it. House Speaker Jay Lucas gave a very, uh, we'll call it impassioned <laughs> speech uh, in which he, uh, on the House floor, in which he said the Senate needs to resolve its squabbles with the governor and leave the House out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, they, everybody sort of calmed down on that last day out of necessity. Uh, and there, there are some options moving forward uh, to get to get some version of that bill passed. It's not something the governor wants. The governor, obviously, in a, in a, in a weak executive state, wants as, as much power as he can get and wants to be able to put his people in jobs. And the Senate wants to retain its control over that process as well. It's probably worth mentioning, too, that that Panthers bill vote was not a, a swooping unanimous vote. I mean, there was yeah. a sure lot of dissent. Right. We even heard from Senator Shane Massey on the show talking about that too. So, um, it's twenty-seven fifteen. They got through it though. I mean, is that? I mean, at this point, it's kind of you what know, it is. I guess you, you know what's interesting about that is that uh, it passed twenty-seven to fifteen. Uh, Twelve to eleven Republicans voted voted against it. Uh, mm -hmm. Twelve voted against it, eleven for it. Uh, but Democrats voted for it fifteen to three. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that is because that bill, the Senate amended it to include greater tax incentives for those rural areas. That's one, one way that the bill was made 
more palatable for Democrats. If that is taken out during conference committee, during these negotiations, do Democrats vote for it as overwhelmingly? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I think it, the bill would still pass, but is it 2715 or is it a lot narrower? Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that raises a lot of questions. And Christina, kind of talking about rural investment right. as well. Uh, one of the big differences we see in the budget, the $9 billion budget that has passed both the House and the Senate, now the conference committee, few differences between both versions, but there, there are some differences between uh, investments in rural communities and those high poverty school districts. Right. That was a big initiative from the governor that both the House and Senate are on board with right now. They're kind of trying to figure out where the sweet spot is for the money. Uh, what's the, the budget process looking like right now in terms of is it going to be quick? Is it going to be drawn out? I mean, we always said more money, more problems, but this year it seems to be pretty pretty easy moving. Yeah, uh, uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Hugh Leatherman has, uh, you know, praised the House. Ways and Means Chairman um, Simrel, uh, he, um, Merle Smith, Merle, I'm sorry, yeah. Merle Smith, has praised him because he said this is a budget that they can work with. They're very pleased with how it is looking. So there are different things that they are on, on board with, $159 million so far that they're looking at providing at least a 4% raise to teachers across the board, uh, looking at raising that minimum teacher starting salary to $35,000. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a provision right now that both sides are they are in agreement with, which is about $25 million to provide that aid to those farmers who have experienced damages from flooding mm -hmm. from um, last year. Mm -hmm. But there's those areas, like you said, there's about a $30 million difference between the House and the Senate in terms of putting that money towards funding for rural infrastructure, for sewage and water. Mm -hmm. So there's just those minor differences. I don't anticipate the budget really being prolonged, but I do know that uh, Hume Letterman said that they really want to work out what they're going to do with Santee Cooper. That's a big area that they want to address before they even get started more into talking about how to negotiate that budget this Santee year. Santee Cooper, the never-ending story. We'll never talk about in a second. Yeah. Right. But, but uh, Avery, just looking at what, what Christine was saying, I mean, we did hear from Speaker Lucas just sing the praises of the governor, and we've also heard similar things from senators, too. Uh, I mean, this is a governor who hasn't showed up in the state house with piglets, you know, or <laughs> been yelling at lawmakers on Facebook or anything like that. There's been a lot. I mean, I'm sure there's been situations back and forth behind closed doors, but for the most part, it seems like a very... A well-oiled machine with this budget. Uh, you know, I, this is the, um, the the relationship between the governor and and lawmakers. Maybe not the Senate at this point in time, <laughs> but it's it's as good as we've seen it in more than a decade. Uh, after after Sanford and Haley, um, who who used the bully pulpit to kind of. Uh, blame lawmakers for issues, issuing report cards, like you said, bringing, bringing the, 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 the piglets to the state house. I think they ended up um, pooping on the floor, yeah, which was an that issue. Was, that was, that was um, <laughs> we weren't here so, for that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is actually, um, you know, with McMaster, he, he has spent a lot of time around the legislature. He presided over the Senate as lieutenant governor. He knows these folks. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got uh, what he says is an open door policy for lawmakers. And I, I think that has helped smooth over a lot of this. Um, there have been several initiatives, including the Panthers, where uh, he he says, all right, we're all going to get on this train and we're going to pass this bill. And he's got the Senate president, Harvey Peeler. He's got the Senate finance chairman, Hugh Leatherman. He's got House Speaker Jay Lucas on his side. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't seen that in a while. It's been really interesting to watch that play out. Mm -hmm. And um, just kind of switching gears to Santee Cooper, can you kind of give us an update? I mean, that's another big sure. contentious thing right now that we even might see lawmakers come back in the fall potentially to see uh, potential bids if they if that's the route they take. Yeah, we're we're twenty future. we're twenty months or twenty one months. I'm not sure after the the nuclear project collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been all these reports about Santee Cooper's role, about SCNG's role, who was at fault, all of that. And lawmakers are still inching toward a uh, decision on whether to sell Santee Cooper, whether to have another company or a firm come in and manage it more efficiently, whether to reform it structurally uh, or whether to do nothing at all, which is a non-zero chance that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so far this year, uh, they, they've spent a lot of time just moving slowly toward that process. And it, these are hard negotiations because you've got senators who, uh, who, especially in the coastal areas, they either have a lot of Santee Cooper employees in their district or they have a lot of Santee Cooper direct serve customers or both. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really difficult to get some of them to on, on board with any process that could potentially end in Santee Cooper being sold. Yeah. So right now we're at a point where 
both the House and the Senate have agreed and they passed legislation that would uh, solicit, have the Department of Administration solicit offers uh, and, and evaluate offers for either the sale or the management of Santee Cooper. But there's slight technical differences um, in, in those two pieces of legislation. And so the House and Senate negotiators are meeting to go over those and try to come to some sort of compromise. Mm -hmm. And then, Christina, was one of those issues that you know lawmakers were like, oh, in the beginning of the session, they didn't want to really have to get into too much because they were so tired of the debate last year with utilities, mm -hmm. but sure enough, we kind of came back to a full circle and uh, Senate leadership told us the other day that that's because they can do two things at once in the Senate. You know, they have that ability to bring that up towards the end, but it did take up a lot of time at the end of the session there, and it did uh, take the air out of the room and still seems to in some cases. Right, and they realize that time is of the essence. This is something they don't want to continue to drag out. So like you said, this is something that they, they're trying to work out, try to create these deadlines to figure out if they do move forward, we need to know if we're going to accept those bids, if we're going to put a time on it. I know the House wanted to put a uh, time on it saying by December that we mm -hmm. wanted to receive those bids. So this is something that they want to move sw fairly swiftly on, but not hastily where they um, mess up or misstep on now, this that's issue. That's a major difference between yeah. the two is that the House wants basically to have a decision made by right. the end of the year, and the Senate's version puts no timeline on it. I mean, imagine that. Um, so, yeah. so the House wants to move quickly, and the Senate, you know, wants to take its time. And we have about five minutes, but I do want to talk about one big thing that we did see get passed this year. Um, that was a solar bill. We saw them eliminate the cap on that uh, rooftop solar, so people can, uh, you know, this, those rates are still being set. They will be set in the future by the PSC going forward, the Public Service Commission. But you know, Avery, I want to talk to you about that, and I also want you to talk a little bit about the auditing that the state now has the ability to do for electric cooperatives, thanks mm -hmm. to your reporting. So if you can kind of yeah, those sure. two together. Yes, all solar, utilities. solar expansion, is, is that's com we're coming to the end of a multi-year fight between uh, green power producers and rooftop solar folks and major utilities who don't want to give up more of their market share. Um, they obviously make money by producing power themselves, so if, if other people are producing that power, they can't make as much money. Uh, eventually, they did come to a compromise that, that lifts that cap on rooftop solar and allows um, power producers, you know, large-scale solar farms to produce energy. If they're producing it cheaper than the major utilities, then they can sell power. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then on the co-op side, um, the state reported last year uh, a lot of issues regarding co-op board pay and um, a scandal at, at Tri-County Electric in St. Matthews uh, exposed a lot of issues that have sort of resulted where there's no oversight. Uh, there's no transparency. There's not a lot of transparency at these electric co-ops that provide power to you know 1.5 million South Carolinians, um, and so lawmakers and, and the co-ops sort of worked together this year to put together a plan that would allow the state's utility watchdog, the Office of Regulatory Staff, to actually audit those co-ops to investigate them for, and raise any red flags, um, and, and basically to be sort of that watchdog on behalf of customers who may not be paying attention to what's going on in their co-op on a day-to-day -day business level or, or may not have the ability to because of the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. So that's a bill that the governor's going to sign tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m., I believe. And, and co-op folks are hoping that sort of helps them turn a new leaf after the Tri-County disaster. Yeah, especially with trust running the way it is in South Carolina with utilities at this point. <laughs> sure. Um, Christina, I want to talk about a couple surprises we saw with about three minutes left. The fetal heartbeat bill really kind of zoomed into the, the spectrum of issues this session. Went through the House pretty quick, but not so much in the Senate. And, and the right. session wasn't really expected to. I mean, right. uh, but are, are there chances that we could be the next Georgia next year going forward? Is I that a possibility? Right. I anticipate the conversation continue next year. Like you said, Georgia, Kentucky, Ohio, the Mississippi have already passed similar measures to this. We saw Alabama pass one of the most restrictive abortion bans in the country. But yes, I anticipate the conversation continue. It does every year. Abortion comes up mm -hmm. every year mm -hmm. in the legislature. So that will be brought up again. It'll Just be a big fight in the big, Senate. Yeah. 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 Like we said, we've been talking about this. Everything seems to be getting pushed to 2020. Right. The abortion ban, school funding, school reform. I mean, there's a lot of different things that are being pushed towards 2020, which is also an election year for all 170 mm -hmm. members of the state house. So. Yeah, and I would expect that to come up last because Everyone on both sides knows that once you bring that up, you can't unbring it up. Right, mm -hmm. It's right. got to be voted on, and so it's going to come up maybe the last two weeks of session, where you know they've already gotten most of the stuff they need to get done for the year, mm -hmm. and they can afford to let everything else die mm -hmm. right. because that that one that that one could run out the clock on the legislature. Well, and, and we've seen what happened last year too when they didn't have enough votes in the Senate to kind of get that bill to move forward, the person to bill and. Your colleague Jeffrey Collins has talked about that too, and I think that's you know they know what they know the votes for it, so then it's it makes it a little bit more difficult to to go forward with something like that. 
Yes, definitely. But I think also another big bill we did see go forward this year was that Samantha Josephson rideshare mm -hmm. bill that you covered as well, right, Christina? Right, correct. And that legislation pretty much says that any ride-sharing businesses, Uber, Lyft will have to display their licenses, license plate numbers on the front of their vehicle. So that was one piece of legislation legislators saw that was very important from the go ahead and pass and go ahead and pass swiftly. So. And, and that puts the onus on the drivers. So, mm -hmm. so a previous version of the bill would have required the, the, the companies like Uber and Lyft to provide illuminated oh, signs. Uh, but they lobbied hard against that, and, and so now the, it's up to the drivers to basically go out and find vinyl stickers or make their own makeshift signs. So that, that's going to be something that's actually we're going to be seeing, um, in, you know, in South Carolina pretty soon. Gotcha. Yeah. So a lot of things, a lot of little things. No, nothing really major. But again, like we we're saying, I think next year, 2020, we're going to be seeing so many different things happen. On top of the fact that it's a primary, of uh, presidential primary, and of course people will be running possibly against some of these lawmakers too, and that. That usually wraps up at the end of March, so mm -hmm. that's when things like you're saying later in session could get more interesting if yeah. they have that ability. To yeah, do there's it. always more mailers, and there's mm -hmm. there's it becomes a lot more political toward the, toward the end for sure. To gotcha. be continued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, for going on this truck with us this year. We've wrapped it for this year, and like we said, a few more things to do, but that's pretty much the legislative session for 2019. Thank you to Christina and Avery for being here today, and thank you for joining us. Also, check out the South Carolina Lead, it's a political podcast that can be found on your podcast app on any mobile device. Each week, I recap the weekly political news with reporters who cover it. In the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio on the campus of the University of South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson.